Hey, Sean, how you doing? Uh, how are you? Good, good. I noticed that you checked in several minutes ago. Did you uh, did you do that hoping to get a little extra time here, or are you just early? Yeah, I just, I just did it up early. Okay, all right, good. I just did up because I there we go. Okay, we'll just start slow. It's only uh, by my clock. 132. So let me uh, share my screen with you lovely people. Let's get that. Uh, oops, back over here. Okay, doke. All righty, if I jump over to the outline really quick. So um, I haven't updated the outline on the web courses yet, but I did move a couple of things around to accommodate our guest speaker uh, next week. So we did Tuesday, <clears throat> who, what, when, where, why, why do I care? And uh, so today I had a presentation about beat sheets, which is pretty quick. Uh, and then we were going, I was going to workshop your uh, dossiers, but I gave you a little bit of extra time on those. And so understanding that you um, just uh, have your beat sheet assignment, I'm going to show you a couple of examples and then you'll have something to go by uh, while you're creating your own. Uh, and we'll look at those um, next week. Um, so let me hop over here really quick. Let's see. We're going to talk about, um, what a beat sheet is, how it can help you. Um, and I've got just, uh, two videos for you. Uh, one from, uh, Blake Snyder about his version of a beat sheet. And then one, uh, from Jill Chamberlain, uh, talking about, um, you know, the existential question, do beat sheets work at all? Um, and she is the uh, inventor of a similar process called the, uh, uh, in a nutshell. So she's going to talk about beat sheets. Uh, we are in section 3B of this week. So we're sort of, I'm trying to wrap up the concept of, for now at least, um, you know, who your characters are, what they're doing, and then some of the broad strokes that they're going through in the course of your, of your treatment. So let's go over to my presentation here and just check that out. Okay, so here we are. This is deck 3B. And today I want to talk to you about beat sheets. So a beat sheet is your, I call them the high spots or the, you know, the, the marquee moments. It's, um, it is a list of your um, most important moments in your narrative that move your story forward. Okay. So your screenplay is uh, the product of several uh, beats all strung together. And they create the emotional reaction in the reader by leading us through the stages of story structure that we've been talking about all along, like, um, you know, setup and inciting incidents and rising action and climax and so forth. Um, the beat sheet process was, de uh, was derived from classic screenplay structure. And I'll show you uh, in particular how it uh, conforms, for instance, to uh, Christopher Vogler's story structure, uh, which is based uh, almost entirely on the Joseph Campbell uh, hero's journey uh, matrix. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, so the question is, where do the beat sheets come from? And we'll answer that right now. So what is it? It's a list of emotional moments, okay? It's the marquee moments in your story one moment leads to another moment leads to another moment okay 
it might follow and probably follows your story outline if you're somebody who does a story outline. A story outline and a beat sheet are kind of the same thing. Uh, so far this semester, we've, we've gone through um, having you do just basic story ideas. Then you created a pitch package, which had things like your log line in it, your synopsis in it, um, a brief explanation of what your story is about or what your um, episodes may be about from episode to episode. Um, a little bit about your characters, but more of that is becoming clear in your character dossiers now, which should be uh, deeper dives into the particulars of certain characters. In, in our case, for the, for the exercise, it was your protagonist and your antagonist. You might do character dossiers for lots of characters in your script um, if you feel it's necessary or if you feel that it helps you sort of wrap your head around the complexity of how your story is flowing and unfolding. I think that they're pretty helpful. And I think that if you, uh, you know, if you, if you utilize that sort of template in the right way, it can, it can help you again, almost help the story write itself uh, before very long. Uh, in my opinion, you should embrace any tool that's going to help you make this process easier for you. Um, beat sheets are just one of those tools and you know, you're going to get out of it what you put into it. So if you, you know, if you have it, but you don't really, you know, use it for much and you, and you don't put in very useful detailed information, they may not have much function or value to you when it comes down right down to the writing of the screenplay. Uh, on the other hand, you know, if they're full of detail and insight into who these characters are, what their lives are like, what their personalities are like, what their subtexts and or backstories are, they might be very valuable. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit about how these beat sheets can work here in a few minutes. So I gave you a template and I know that this process for some people, not everybody, I mean, some people I think take to this process rather well um, and it feels very comfortable to sit down and, and contrive a world and populate it with characters and, and color those characters with dimension and objectives. Uh, and then I think for other folks, uh, you know, we, we know we want to be writers, but it's, it's a little bit more laborious for some folks, I think. And so uh, when you have the spark of an idea, you know, nothing uh, feels better, I think, than when you complete a beat sheet, because it really gives you a roadmap of what your stories, how your story is going to unfold with pace and with, you know, chronology or arrangement. And you can move beats around and you can play with that a little bit as you sort of fine tune how you want your story to uh, unfold for the audience and, and really get a good sense of what's going on in terms of um, beginning, middle and end events that lead one from another to your ultimate conclusion. Um, so I think it's a good tool. Um, here is uh, some fun facts. This one comes from, I think Pete Russell uh, indicated that beats should follow a frequency and the frequency is about 14 to 15 beats per half an hour. And that's interesting. So if you think about the three X structure and you think about a half an hour TV show, for instance, and you, you think about where your commercial breaks are. So you got a commercial break after the first three minutes. Then you've got another one after about another six to eight minutes. And then you have, you know, your resolution and your wrap up, and then your show is pretty much over. So you can sort of figure out how many beats you have to have in each one of those sections and, or acts uh, in order to keep that show flowing properly in and around your commercial breaks and through the course of a, you know, a well-designed arc that lasts, you know, 30 minutes of screen time or 23 minutes of screen time, as it were. And if you follow that premise, then logically you can assume that you're going to have 28 to 30 beats in an hour. Okay. So 
just keep that in mind for a moment because when I show you a beat sheet, you'll see what it looks like and then you'll be able, this will make a little bit more sense to you. Okay, so understand that this, like everything else that I'm telling you is a guideline. It's not a hard and fast rule. You don't have to do these things if you're not comfortable uh, with this tool for some reason. Uh, though I can't imagine what you know the uh, excuse might be, but uh, let's say you just don't see it or you don't get it. Um, maybe this type of creation comes naturally to you, and so you might be inherently doing it and not even realize it, and you don't need a template to help you break down your internalizations. Um, if that's the case, you know more power to you. Um, but these are like guidelines, and I <laughs> and I. I robbed a little meme from uh, from uh, Jeffrey Rush. Uh, he has a great line in uh, Pirates of the Caribbean about uh, about things being more like guidelines and less like rules. And that's really what it is. Okay. Um, just remember that if the prescription is 14 or 15 beats in a half an hour and you've got 10, you might be, you know, running a little behind you might your your story might be a little slow or a little bit boring and you might need to step up the action a little bit uh on the other hand too many beats and the audience might find it difficult to follow the action and, and figure out what's really going on because you're throwing too much information at them at one time so it's really kind of a, a delicate balance but either way they're more like guidelines okay so we're going to, I'm going to show you a video in a little bit about uh, from Blake Snyder and his uh, notion of uh, how a beat sheet works. I also pulled a sample from uh, the No Film School website where they have their own beat sheet template. The problem I have with the beat sheet template is it's, um, everybody's kind of got their own opinion. Um, the No Film School beat sheet template and um, Blake Snyder's sort of follow a 15 um, beat um, uh, pattern uh, where they maintain that there's like 15 in this one, there's 16 principal beats uh, in a full length story. Um, you don't have to have this many beats in your story. You may have more, you may have less. Um, if you've looked at the um, story structure PDF that I've that I've given to you yet, uh, we'll look at it again. Uh, we'll look at it next week for a little bit. You'll see some of those structure uh, theories by a couple of those folks uh, have as many as 22 or 25 beats. Uh, some of them have eight or nine. Um, Joseph Campbell in the Hero's Journey calls for 12. Christopher Vogel, uh, Vogler calls for 12. Okay, so pick the one you're most comfortable with, the one that makes the most sense um, and use it, you know, if it helps, it's just a tool, right? So there's a link to the No Film School uh, uh, template. And I think that it's trying to follow the hero's journey, the 12 stages, but they give you a total of 16. There's some extra stuff in here, I think that sort of relates, but they've break, broken it into an, an isolated beat. Um, but if you compare their 16 beat template from No Film School to the Christopher Vogler slash Joseph Campbell Hero's Journey, you can sort of see how they compare relatively, uh, they're very, very similar, they're very close in what's going on, okay? Um, they've added stuff like if you notice in the um, in the no film school template, they've they've offered something called the first frame. The very first thing we see when the curtain rises or when the lights go down in the theater and you know, after the opening credit, what do we see or during the opening credits, what do we see. So they're adding something called the first frame here and then they go to their second beat, the world around us, which is in the in the Campbell Vogler world the ordinary world, which is step one of the hero's journey, okay? Protagonist introduction, character traits, um, that's all kind of included in Joseph Campbell's ordinary world and Christopher Vogler's ordinary world, where they're talking about establishing who that character is in their present and what their inner 
uh, evolution might be, hints at what that evolution might be. And then there's a, a call to action or an inciting incident, which is down here, um, I guess, in step five in the, uh, in the no film school template. So there will be some subtle differences. Not everybody agrees on how you're going to finally break down all these steps, whichever is the most comfortable for you. Uh, this has been around for a very long time because Joseph Campbell, you know, uh, has been a lecturer and educator and he's been talking about this stuff for decades. So um, this tends to be um, the approach that I gravitate towards, although you know, it kind of varies. It all really depends on the topic or the subject matter that I'm dealing with, uh, how I choose to break it down. But I'm mindful of this sort of roadmap um, to, to keep me on point, to keep me on, on topic so that I don't stray or get lost in my own sort of tangent or parallel storylines that are possible within any story, really. You know, I use this to keep me on, on point. So let me show you really quick. And you know what, let's go to an example really quick before we look at these two videos. And then I'll show you a second example uh, if we have time and you can sort of compare the differences. So the first example will be um, one of my documents. Let me, uh... okay, so I have, um... Here we go. Here's a beat sheet. I also have a character uh, dossier here. Um, and I can show you how I filled mine in if you guys are interested. But uh, here's the beat sheet that I did for a uh, short film that I wrote uh, as part of my master's uh, degree. So you can see that I have uh, the working title, which ultimately did change. Um, and then I have uh, a note, there was a criteria for the short film, which was we weren't, they didn't want us to write a story or a script that was, that had more than uh, three or four locations in it. So I made a note that while I have more slug lines, so it looks like I have more locations, that it was all sort of revolving around a common um, courtyard or common area in an office building. So. Uh, I open up with my first uh, slug line, which is interior subway station day. So that's my opener. And the very first beat, um, I think I added to this later, my very first beat is something similar to what we saw in the uh, template from No Film School, which is a first frame. And that beat is um, just a wide shot of a really, really crowded subway platform uh, in rush hour in the morning in New York City. Okay. Um, this beat describes uh, the train car. Uh, it's going to pull up, the doors are going to open, and the passengers are going to rush inside. And the hero, who we find via a camera move, uh, is sort of swept along with the flow into the train car. Okay. So this whole thing is sort of a setup to get us. Um, into the train and then running on the train and getting to our destination, which is the, uh, the office courtyard, okay? So the train doors open, the passengers rush inside and our hero who we find with the lens is swept along with the flow. Another angle, the hero makes his way through the crowded car and he is sort of rebuffed by the crowd. You know what that means? Put off by the crowd. There's a lot of people, it's densely packed train car. He's trying to find his way through to find his two cronies that he's going to ride to the office with. He finds those guys and he saddles up alongside his two cohorts. They discuss the crowded rabble. None of them are pleased to have to ride alongside the working stiffs. Another angle, the train lets out at the downtown station. The crowd surges up the stairs and out of the subway station. What we'll see visually is that these guys, these, these three guys are Wall Street types. And it's not sort of outlined or detailed in the beat sheet because that is somewhere else in my documents. It's in my, uh, it's in my character dossiers um, and it's in my uh, treatment or my pitch uh, package. 
who these who these guys are and what the details of those individuals is. This is just beats of action. Okay, what's happening? And one beat begets another, begets another, begets another. Right. So if I'm opening my shot on a loaded train platform, and then I locate my hero visually, and he's swept into the train car, then he's pushing his way through the crowd. He finds his buddies. They all discuss their uh, dissatisfaction with the crowd and the packedness and of rush hour. And then they're dumped off ultimately at their stop, which is the courtyard outside the office building. All right. So there's one, two, three, four, five beats, right? This could easily be the first two to three minutes of the piece, right? If this was a TV show, I think ultimately this script is, uh, I think it's nine pages. Um, this is just the first uh, scenes, the first three scenes, I guess. So ultimately, I think the whole thing was uh, nine or 11 pages, I forget. So um, the next slug line, okay, so this is the next scene or the next setup is exterior subway entrance, okay? So you guys, have you guys ever been to New York City or any city with a subway, with a subterranean uh, people mover and you have the access stairs from the sidewalk at street level and you go down into the subway? You guys know what I'm talking about? Okay, that's what this is, exterior subway entrance days, but it's the one at their destination, at their place of work. So uh, in this beat, a homeless man is seen shuffling around the stairway entrance, milling through the trash. He's on his, uh, he's in the way of the group as the Wall Street types, Phil and his cronies collide with him as they emerge from below. The group chastises the homeless man for being a nuisance, teasing and ridiculing him and his situation. Seeing the futility of their jibes, the group decides to give it up and go for coffee before they go in, before they go inside to work. And the homeless guy's going to make his way in their direction, hoping for some spare change or you know something to eat or a cup of coffee, whatever they want to give him. Okay, so those are the beats for this scene: one, two, three, four, five more beats. Exterior coffee stand. So really all we've done is gone from the subway entrance to the coffee stand, which is across the courtyard. Okay. The group is continuing their banter, financial stuff, boyish remarks about the weather, etc. cetera. Cy is the name of the homeless man. So Cy catches the attention of the group again. They jeer him openly. They're mocking the guy. They're teasing him, right? Get a job, you know, that kind of thing. Cy lobbies for their spare change and he prostrates himself. You guys know what prostrate means? Bowing and scraping, right? Please, do you have any spare change? You know, Phil asks Cy why he lets himself be mistreated. Get a job is the exchange from another. Cy remarks that he's once like them and he staggers off to hunker in his alley. I was once like you and he runs off into the alley. Okay, so this is the first sort of confrontation. And what what we don't really get a sense of here yet, uh, or you may not, but I know that this is Phil's uh, first inciting moment. This is the, uh, an emotional change is going to happen in my main character. And he's going to go from being a snobby Wall Street six figure type to somebody who empathizes with the needs and the situation of a homeless person who's just trying to get by in uh, through hard uh, economic times, okay? And so while the character doesn't yet know it, this is his first inciting moment. There's gonna be a couple of them, but this is the first one, okay? You could, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you a sample uh, in a couple of minutes where those moments are actually labeled in the beat sheet. I don't label them in the beat sheet, um, but I kind of know what they are. So, and since this is my document, uh, I'm not necessarily ever going to show anybody this beat sheet document since it's only me and it's my notes and I know what they mean. I don't put those labels in there. But um, if, for instance, you were on a writing staff and you were accountable for the beat sheet, they might want you to label it so everybody in the group understands what you thought the inciting moments were. 
Okay, so you might want to label them for the sake of other collaborators. I didn't have collaborators on this script. I wrote it myself, so I kind of knew what was up and I didn't feel the need to do all that labeling. Um, so it's really up to you, okay? The, the other sample I'm going to show you is, is done the other way with labels, okay? All right, the coffee stand. They're picking on Cy. Okay. Now we're going to cut to, basically, interior Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe offices day. Same day, okay? Beat one. In the midst of his work sipping coffee, Phil looks out the window to the street below. From his vantage point, Phil can see Cy going through his daily business of panhandling. Phil's secret uh, secretary enters with documents. Phil asks her to check out the pathetic homeless guy down below. Her point of view of Cy is more compassionate than Phil expected. Phil gives him, it gives Phil pause for thought. Okay. This isn't really, I'm, I'm kind of filling in linguistically the, the gaps in these beats so that it's a little more conversational for you. But it's not, it isn't as though I transcribed my treatment right onto the beat sheet, although it's pretty close. So I think this is why it might be important for you. Um, it's not so critical that you be precise in each of your documents leading up to your draft if you sort of fill in the gaps for yourself throughout the process. Okay, so... Um, I transcribed uh, what was my treatment for the story into my beat sheet and I filled in the moments and got rid of the ones that weren't contributing to the steady flow, one from the next to the next to the next. So first he's in his office looking out the window. Then he gets a notion that this guy is kind of detestable. So he asks his secretary, what do you think? And she gives him an answer that he didn't expect. Okay. Now, there's not really any dialogue here. In a couple of places, I've thrown in a little bit of what is the sense of the dialogue. But if I read you the scene coming up, you'll see that there's no dialogue in here to speak of. This is just the action beats to help me understand how these characters are moving through the world, who they're going to interact with, in what order, and how does that lead from one moment to the next and take me through my story. Is that making sense so far? Anyone? I can't see you guys because you got all got your videos turned off. There we go. Okay. Okay. So inside the office. Ah, here we go. End of act one. Okay. So at the end of act one, what has happened? We've seen the world. We've seen the main characters in the world. We've gotten a sense of who they are by their action. And we've seen a setup with a confrontation that is the primary character, the protagonist's first inciting moment. We've gotten all of that accomplished in act one, okay? So, and if this was a TV show and I was using the subway station as a teaser and maybe exterior subway day, these two shots here as a teaser, um, then this would be the teaser and this would be the end of act one, okay? And we might label it teaser um, in, in the structure of our outline. So where I have end of act one here, I would have up here in bold teaser, or sometimes we call it a cold open, right? And, and then we would have beginning of act one interior subway station day, okay? So there's the end of act one. Act two opens in another location in a cocktail bar uh, that same night. And it's a one-shot deal, so it's a it's a tableau. Um, interior cocktail night, one shot. Phil shuffles from the bar with his cronies and sees Cy making his way uh, around in the shadows. It's one of those things where he leaves the bar and in the corner of his eye, he catches sight of the homeless guy still milling around in the world after everybody has gone home for the day. It might be a superfluous beat when I started writing the draft, I had to make a decision if I wanted to keep this in there or not. Was it moving the story along? The next scene is the coffee stand the following day. Phil is grabbing a, a coffee by himself. He missed his friends on the way to work today. He was late on the train and he's coming in alone. 
Sai sees Phil along uh, alone and recognizes his opportunity to talk with him. Phil hesitates and tries to avoid Sai's advances. Sai says, I know who you are and I was once like you. Phil cusses him off and makes moves towards work and Sai gets knocked down uh, by a hastened office worker who threatens to call the cops. Phil witnesses the abuse and has second thoughts about how he treated Sai. He helps Sai to his feet and sits him down nearby feels bad and offers Sai a drink. This is another sort of an increase in the action and escalation, right? So we had the first inciting moment was, was con confronting Sai in the, in, the, in the first act. In the second act, it's the escalation is kind of rising. Now these two are bumping into each other a little bit more and they're, they're being drawn towards one another so they can uh, have, a, have a conflict uh, and then a resolution. So this is one scene, exterior alley entrance day. Over a coffee, Cy tells Phil his story. Phil is engrossed in, Cy, in Cy's tale and loses track of time. Phil rushes off to work, leaving Cy alone. So this is like a time, um, there's a time displacement that happens in the exterior alley entrance day. And that's not evident in the beat sheet, but it's evident in the working script. Okay, so this is more like a this is more like a montage. It's not going to be a scene where we're going to have a, a lot of extensive dialogue and detail. It's really going to be a scene where we get a sense visually that these two guys sit down and they have a parlay and um, get to know one another, and we just sort of see that uh, through the benefit of the uh, of the um, the voyeuristic camera, the, you know, the omnipotent camera or the omniscient camera. Okay. Next scene, interior financial office, same day. Phil is met with the chaos when he exits the elevator. So this is an opening shot. Think Wolf of Wall Street, same kind of deal. You know, uh, camera starts on the elevator doors, elevator doors open, reveal Phil. Phil emerges from the elevator and the reverse is chaos in the office, right? All of that becomes evident in the working script. That's all camera direction. And that's something that we don't necessarily need to have in a beat sheet. I know it in my head because I know that I'm going to add that later. Um, so I don't have any indication of that here. I just know because, you know, it's my work that that's what's happening next. The whole office is in a panic. There has been an event at the exchange, the stock exchange. Phil makes his way to the office and is yanked into the conference room. The shit has hit the fan. Where the hell were you is the accusation. Phil is fired. End of act two. Okay. So act two, we have a rise in the, in the stakes. Uh, the confrontation with the antagonist becomes clear. The ramifications of which are seen uh, at the conclusion of the act, which is he's fired. So that might be a, uh, the first setback, right? Exterior fountain, coffee, piazza, another day. Phil sits sipping coffee, talking with his fellow unemployed. Phil is spotted by some who are not laid off in the meltdown. In other words, there's some office people that are still coming to work every day, grabbing their coffee and going upstairs into the trading room. Phil is not one of them since Phil was fired, uh, but he sees those people uh, now, because he spends his day drinking coffee, sitting in the courtyard, talking to other people who were also fired for whatever reason on the, the day of the, the crash. Phil notices their tone is similar to the way they used to regard Cy. Exterior Cy's alley day. Phil looks for Cy. Cy is aggressive towards Phil and tells him that he's not welcome, that he needs to find his own alley. Phil, rise, Phil realizes even Cy no longer regards him with respect. Okay. Interior subway car later. Okay, so that's the end of this beat sheet for now. Okay, it gets me to the end of Act 2, and it sets up Act 3. Uh, and then at that point, I think, uh, I don't think I had conclu concluded Act 3 yet uh, in my head. So I didn't really, uh, I didn't have any beats to put down at that particular time. But you can see how one beat is leading to the next. It's kind of detailing what happens in a scene. I've got at least four or five beats with the exception of 
of the one vignette that I showed you in the exterior cocktail bar night. And it reads like a wide vignette and it's just a detail uh, getting me from the end of act one, okay? Where he's in his office before the shit hits the fan and the start of act two where he's late for work and he's going to enter the office and it's all chaos, right? But rather than going from Phil's in the office and everything's fine to a completely separate day where Phil is in the office and the shit's hitting the fan, I put in a vignette in the middle to separate those two uh, pieces of or those two events uh, and put in something that could also maybe add a little bit to the story in terms of you know, who Sai is and the fact that he's always there because he lives in that alley because he's homeless guy. And during the day, he's begging for change. And at night, he's rooting around in the trash looking for food and, and bits of useful whatever, right? So I just use that sort of as a, as a buffer so that it wouldn't be such a, a jarring jump cut between the office when it's okay and the office when it's uh, when there's a stock crash, okay? Because that I think would have been too jarring to go from one thing to the other if it's not you know part of the story structure necessarily. And so I added this little buffer in the, in between. Okay. So if I show you the uh, the the working script document at that point, I can show you. Let me reduce this. I can show you how that's how that sort of opens up. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this was written in final draft. And like I said, you know, if you guys haven't downloaded it and started playing with it yet, you should you should do that um, pretty soon because you're going to have a, a draft due pretty soon. OK, um, but this was done in final draft and the formatting was kind of auto formatted for me by the software. This is my top sheet. Okay, this is the title page and everybody should have one. Don't give me a final draft document that has the top sheet that hasn't been filled in. Okay, your script, your work, your name should be on it. Okay, that's how the big, that's how the big boys do it. Okay. Um, I put Full Sail University on there and my phone number, but that's, you know, you don't have to bother with that. Um, okay, so the working title at the time was no good d goes unpunished now we have um we have the shooting script uh revised title a simple twist of fate okay so it's not the same title that we were working with in the beginning and that is fairly common okay many many times i've started a movie in pre-production with a script that was called one thing and principal photography was done and the call sheets all had that working title and the script revisions all had that working title. And then somewhere in post-production, the working title became the show title of the movie. And so then the movie comes out and it's called something else and you don't realize that you worked on it until you figure out that Tears of the Sun was called, uh, what was it called? Hostile Rescue when we were working on it. Okay, so it was Hostile Rescue. It was the untitled Bruce Willis project in the very beginning. Then in principal photography, it started being called Hostile Rescue. Once the script revision started flowing and everybody, you know, sort of understood what we were doing. Uh, and it was Hostile Rescue throughout principal photography. And then in the transition from principal to post-production, it became Tears of the Sun. And I, you know, so maybe Antoine Fuqua intended it to be Tears of the Sun the whole time, or maybe he didn't. I don't know the answer to that question, only he does. Um, but understand that that happens a lot. So it's not gonna be unusual if some of your documents have a different title than your finished script will have, okay? Okay, starts off, fade in, interior subway station, Monday morning, okay? And I said Monday morning here instead of simply day, okay? Um, I think if you were a, um, a traditionalist and you were asking for a script from a young writer, um, you might instruct them not to embellish like this, to just say, is it day or night? And day or night goes here, 
Okay. But I put Monday morning in here specifically because I want it because Monday morning means something different than any old morning, doesn't it? There's something about Monday morning that's a little bit different than any other day of the week in the morning, especially if you're on your way to work. Okay. So I wanted to make sure that that tone translated. Okay. So I put Monday morning in here instead of day. Okay. Uh, a crowded platform, Phil, 40s, a Wall Street type, waiting, looks at his watch, squeezed by the crowd, clutches a briefcase. Those are all the salient moments of that opening shot. Okay. Think the, uh, uh, what do we have here? Think the, um, the no film school first frame. Okay. That's what that is. It's a first frame. It's a sense of the world in the very first point of view. Okay. A guy on the platform, forties, a wall street type waiting, pushed around, clutches his briefcase close. We know several things. Uh, we know roughly his age. We know that he's male because of the way he's dressed wall street type. Okay. In my mind and in a lot of people's minds, when you say a Wall Street type, what do you think of? What comes to mind immediately if I say he's a Wall Street type? What do you think of? What? How is he going to be dressed? Like from Mad Men? Yeah, and probably an overcoat because it's in the morning and he's traveling to work. If he's wearing an expensive suit, he doesn't want it to get soiled. So he's probably got an overcoat on. He's got a, maybe a three-piece, at least a two-piece, right? And he's clutching a briefcase, probably leather, probably nice and fancy. GM financial. Okay. Uh, and he's waiting and he's squeezed by the crowd. So we're going to get a sense of his frustration right off the bat. He's clutching that briefcase. That tells us there's something important inside. And he's dressed like and looks like a Wall Street type. So it's probably, you know, proprietary information about what he does, stock trading, right? And he's protecting that from the crowd. He doesn't want that to get yanked out of his hand. Cut to interior subway car angle on the doors. Okay, again, now I'm a pretty bad role model in this regard. I have 30 years of looking at working scripts to my credit. Okay, so most of my career was spent receiving the final product, the working product from the writers, not preliminary versions, not initial drafts, not you know, I get revisions and everything, but all the revisions that I used to get were based on the working script at that point. The working script has camera direction in it. So as a writer, you know, I have things in some of my scripts that you guys probably shouldn't include in yours until you're a little more established, right? Because if, if you don't have an IMDB and you don't have any a resume with any movie credits yet, but you have camera direction in your scripts, a studio exec is going to assume that you don't know really one camera direction from the other, and they might not like seeing that in your, in your, in your uh, spec scripts. So I would recommend you don't put stuff like that in unless you're really, really sure that it needs to be there. And it's kind of important to how the, the, the scene sort of uh, unveils itself. If that's the case, put it in. And, and that sentiment is outlined in the screenwriter's Bible that I gave you in PDF form as well. Okay. And it's about putting camera direction in to uh, direction like this into action lines and into slug lines. Okay. So this is a slug line and this is an action line. Okay. Slug line is where you are and, and what time of day and whether you're inside or outside. And then the action line describes what's happening. And then you have dialogue and you have characters, okay? Angle on the doors. Doors part, the surge of passengers spills into the train. So immediately you get a sense of what's happening in this shot, right? In this, and this is the world. The world is chaotic. New York City, subway, Monday morning. That's the world, right? So I'm trying to set the tone of that in the very beginning. Doors part, surge of passenger spills into the train. Another angle, zoom in on Phil as he makes his way through the crowded car. Phil's POV, more Wall Streeters, trench coats, clutching briefcases, clinging to the stirrups, struggling to read the Wall Street Journal. 
Okay. It's all stereotypical imagery, right? And it all supports the tone, which is busy Monday morning on the subway, Wall Streeters on the way to work, right? Interior next car. Phil saddles up beside Roger, 50, a tall, gloomy looking man. Phil acknowledging his friend. Okay, here's dialogue. So there's a couple of things that we're learning some things in this in the script that we didn't know necessarily in my beat sheet. So far, I'm following the beat sheet and then I'm adding some extra detail in my working script, camera direction. And I'm also telling you who the characters' names are if I haven't told you already. I told you the protagonist's name and the antagonist's name in the beat sheet, but I didn't tell you anybody else's name. Well, here we are. We're going to meet Roger for the first time, and I'm going to describe him as 50, tall and gloomy looking. Okay, that's how you introduce a character into a script. Okay, especially in this day and age. Roger, the first time we see that character, his name is all in capitals. And then in parentheses, we put his age and then a tall, gloomy looking man. Why do we do this? Okay. Why do I do this? Okay. This is for my collaborators. This is for the makeup people. This is for the casting director. This is for the wardrobe supervisor. Okay. And this is also for the director. Okay. Roger, tall man. Wardrobe's going to need to know they need uh, outfits for a tall, middle-aged Wall Street type. Okay, Wall Street needs to know. Gloomy is sort of a, a clue to the director. What kind of personality is this guy? Bubbly, serious, uh, gloomy, sad, depressed. Okay, so I made him a tall, gloomy-looking man. What, you know, what can you get from the word gloomy that you might not get from any other descriptor? And he's 50. You have a sense of who this guy is? Anyone? I can't see you guys, so you're going to have to say something. Is it just that, like, he shouldn't be dressed? like in super bright clothes or anything, and he's just kind of a dull person. These are fairly specific clues, aren't they? And if he's a gloomy Gus, he, he might be a gloomy Gus for a number of reasons. But what we did learn in the beat sheet is it's very crowded. They're on a subway. All types are on the subway, right? He's a Wall Street type, so he probably, he's gloomy, which means he probably has uh, an elitist superiority complex, right? Especially if he's a Wall Street type and he's middle-aged, he's probably been successful. He's wealthy. He's dressed nice. He works on Wall Street. And he's gloomy because he doesn't feel like he should have to be riding the subway to work especially when he has a Mercedes sitting in his driveway in New Jersey. We learn that later in the script. But these are clues to who, what kind of person this guy might be, okay? And then we go through the dialogue. So what I'm hoping that you're seeing, and you might see it in the next example, maybe better than here, is all the steps from my beat sheet are in here. My beat sheet was derived from my treatment, which was basically what my story was about with a certain level of detail. But I didn't worry about dialogue in either of those two preceding documents. This is where the dialogue starts to manifest itself in my first draft, okay? And I can get very quickly from documents to my first draft uh, by just sort of transposing a lot of that information into final cut, uh, final draft. And final draft even has, I don't use it, but final draft has a beat sheet function. So you can build a beat sheet in final draft and then use that beat sheet to start outlining your script. Okay. So this is kind of how we build these documents. We don't just sit down and open up final draft and start banging out a script. Nobody does that. Nobody. Okay. So, but it's not really that tough if you know how to utilize all of these, you know, these preceding steps. Okay. So, 
what I, I kind of like that idea because what I can do is when I start building a script is I can go right from my beat sheet and I can start adding my slug lines in here and then start filling stuff in. Once I got my slug lines, I look at my beats and my beats become my action lines and I just sort of fill in the information a little bit better. I color it in, as you might say, right? And then it's just going to leave. Well, who's involved? Character A and character B. I'll put them in there just like this. And then I just need to add their dialogue at some point. Okay. And so I think about what's happening. What's the tone of my story? I get my tone from my treatment. I get my what's happening from my beat sheet. I have my tone and my action in the in those two documents. That gives me a sense of how these characters are gonna are gonna interact with one another. And then I have things like, you know, these these clues as to who these people are to give me a sense of what that guy might say now. So Phil says, How are the Hamptons? How's Chloe? Meaning, how's your wife? All right, this is what he says the first thing in the morning when he sees somebody that he recognizes. Roger flips his paper over, grasps the stirrup and snorts. Visibly disgusted is what we call a parenthetical. So that is a, a tone uh, clue for the director. Okay, and again, uh, beginning script writers, you probably want to avoid parentheticals, at least in the beginning, until you're a little bit more established and your writing has, ha has sort of spoken for itself a little bit. But Roger's going to turn to him and say, it rained all weekend. Chloe spent the whole time on the phone with her mother, and I played 18 holes of championship golf on the fucking living room carpet. Okay, so now this response to Phil matches the clue about who Roger is in the first place, and he just cements it by being kind of a dick when he responds to Phil about how he spent his weekend, right? He was upset that it rained. He kind of disdains his wife a little bit. He wanted to go golfing, but he couldn't because it was raining outside. So he putted around on the carpet and kind of blew off the whole weekend. Roger mimes a golf shot with his newspaper. Roger continued. Continued happens if the dialogue from this character resumes over or straddles an action line like this. He he mimes his golf shot with his newspaper. And final draft will put continued in there for you if you have uh, the same character following an action line. It'll just put continued in automatically. That's that auto formatting thing that I was telling you about, which is kind of nice. Now I'm forced to endure this indignity. He looks around because my Benz is in the shop so much for luxury automobiles, right? So again, he's telling us more about himself. Gloomy, rich Wall Street type has to take the bus to school in the morning because his car's in the shop. And what is it? It's a Mercedes, a luxury automobile. Right. So now we I think we know as much as we need to know about who Roger is. So he looks around in disgust, then at Phil as and I have Ariel in, in parentheses here, more camera direction. We're now in a high wide shot of the exterior of the train car. The train barrels down the tracks towards the financial district. The first exchange happened inside the car. We're going to have a break in the action to show you an aerial of the train zipping down towards uh, uh, towards the financial district downtown. Okay, Roger, how do you suffer this commute? He asks. Roger covers his nose with a hanky as if the smell. Phil responds, oh, it's usually not this bad. Anyway, I go where the job takes me. We're kind of learning a little bit about who Phil is in his dialogue as well. He could say a lot of things. Oh, I take it all the time. It's no big deal. That dialogue, though, doesn't tell me much about Phil. So we learn a little bit about his personality. I go where the job takes me, and it's not usually this bad. So he's a little bit of an optimist, and he does what he has to do, right? And he doesn't think much about it. As, on the other hand, Roger is suffering the indignity of the ride the whole way. So Roger, we get a sense of who Roger is. We get a sense of who Phil is, right? So I want to talk to you guys more in, uh, a week after next about dialogue and stuff. But as you can see, all you got to do is start coloring in the dialogue if you've got your beats all worked out. If you know what's going to happen and the beats are all kind of falling in line, it starts to become fairly simple to, to color in with some dialogue. And then you just have to think about who these characters are. That's what your beat, that's what your dossiers are all about, right? So I have a dossier that describes Roger in detail. Who is this guy? You know, what's he like? How does he dress? 
you know, there's all kinds of stuff in Roger's uh, character dossier. So that's what you guys should be building right now for your antagonist and your protagonist. So that when it comes time to put words in their mouth, you're going to have a real strong sense of who these guys are, these people, whoever they are. You'll have a strong sense of the world they're in and what's going to happen to them. And then just let them let the character say it. Sounds easier said than done, I know, but it, it really uh, starts to become um, pretty mechanical, which is nice. So let me close up this example. And now having discussed at least one uh, example, let's uh, ask Jill Chamberlain if she thinks these things work or not. Let's see what she has to say. Do beat sheets work? I think having an outline is an excellent idea. Um, uh, I I do know writers who don't need them. Uh, I think they need something. And, and, and these are going to be writers, I speak of writers I've worked with. So they are tend to already be um, devotees of using the nutshell technique. And that might be all they do. They won't do a beat sheet. They'll just do a nutshell technique form. And as long as they are true to that, they'll, they'll have it and it's nice and solid. And maybe they'll work with me one-on-one -on -one to make sure their, their nutshell is solid. They'll tack it up on their bulletin board and then they'll write from that and they don't do any other beat sheet or outlining. Um, I think most writers need a beat sheet or outline. They need more detail than that, but it, it varies. As long as you, so as long as you have a solid structure, um, you don't necessarily need more than this. You know, the idea, this isn't drawn to scale, um, but you'll see that most of my structure things are in act one and act three, and the only thing that's in act two is this one element here. And act two is actually twice as long. Um, so I don't have a bunch of structure requirements. I don't have required beats in your act two, even act two, even though act two is twice as long. I strongly believe that if you properly structure things in act one and you properly structure things in act three, it does all the heavy lifting of supporting your act two, even though your act two is twice as long as long as you maintain conflict. Um, so I know lots of writers who hate beat sheets <laughs> and, and they ask me, can I really throw it out? And I was like, you absolutely can. If you don't like doing a beat sheet, you don't find that helpful, you can. As long as you find a nice solid structure and you stay true to it, um, uh, this should be enough to guide you as long as you have conflict. Um, I do think most writers need more detail. And so I, you know, uh, but it, it, it's up to the writer a little bit. So more detail. I don't, I don't think it's a good idea to do a super detailed one because you want to allow a certain amount of discovery on the page. Um, I mean, that's why I like having the looser structure of the nutshell to begin with. We have a couple things you got to hit. Um, if you shift from them, then you're, you're screwing up your story. Um, but if you stay solid to these elements, that might not might be all you need and you can just write and live on the page as long as you hit those couple of moments um, or perhaps you need a little bit more structure a little bit of an outline or a beat sheet um, but i don't recommend doing super detailed ones um, there's a thing i call beat sheet fatigue where people just spend too much time on that, particularly if you're getting feedback, if you're sharing your, your um, nutshell or your, or your, I'm sorry, your beat sheet or your outline with your writing group or, or people like that, you know, maybe get feedback on maybe like an eight page one. If it's any longer than that, it's getting into so much detail that we'd rather read the script at that point. Um, you know, a beat sheet ultimately is for your benefit anyway so what it's whatever you need if, if you need a little more structure than just this and like i said i think most people need a little bit more i think it's a pretty good idea to have a loose guide of you know this happens i think this happens then this happens and this happens but kind of loose so that you can discover somewhat on the page okay so there's a couple of caveats in there now all right the first one is she's pointing at her own sort of nutshell technique and she's written a book called, I think it's screenwriting using the nutshell technique or the nutshell technique. Um, and, you know, it's another version of a beat sheet with a more simplistic approach, I guess. Uh, I have the book. I haven't read it yet. Um, I bought it, uh, you know, as a reference more than as uh, a possible solution. I don't perceive myself to have a, a problem with uh, 
creating beat sheets, I, I use them. I outline, I actually outline first and then create a beat sheet from an outline. And then the beat sheet, you know, loads into final draft and becomes uh, a working initial draft. Okay, so that's my process. Um, but she says, okay, as long as you've got everything in act one and act three, uh, it's easy to fill in act two, even if it's longer than the other two, the other two nutshells. And as long as you maintain conflict, well, yeah, that's kind of the whole process. So to sort of minimize it and say, all you've got to do is maintain conflict and, you know, fill it in is saying a mouthful really. Uh, and I think that that's a little bit misleading. Um, it's true. Not all writers use beat sheets and no, they are not necessary, but, um, like I said, they can become a very, uh, useful part of a, of a writing process. Um, so, you know, just bear that in mind when you have somebody who's introducing an alternate technique to a traditional, uh, industry practice, right? They're kind of selling you on their idea because in that way they can also sell books about their idea and they can, you know, build credibility as being, she happens to be, Jill is a, uh, what they call a script doctor in LA. So she's somebody who, if you, if you're, if you're a producer and you have a script or you bought a script uh, as an initial draft, um, you might go to somebody like Jill and have Jill do a, what we call a buff on that script. In other words, it's a good script, but there's something about it. It needs a little something. And you might, as a producer, take that script to a buff writer and have them just give it a, give it a brush up. Okay. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that a, a script doctor will look at is, you know, is this script following an, a, a structure? What is that structure? Uh, and then they might back engineer a beat sheet from that script to see if it works linearly, uh, you know, on a, uh, you know, on an analytical level, you know, if you're the kind of person who likes to just sit down and bang an idea out before you lose it in your head, that's, that's okay. I suppose, I suppose it could be one writing process that you might uh, write a script and then pull a, you know, back engineer a beat sheet out of it to see, you know, to see where you could tweak the story and to see where you could improve the flow. Uh, I suppose that could be one possible approach. Um, the way I work is I have a nugget of an idea and that idea will rattle around in my head, um, as a virtual treatment, if you will, uh, for quite a while. I don't, I don't tend to write anything down on an initial idea for quite a while until it's been in my head marinating for a significant period of time. And then, uh, the next thing I'll do is I'll start with an outline. And I'll do an outline of my story concept with all of the broad strokes. And at that point, I might make a treatment. And then from that point, I'll take the outline and the treatment and I'll extract a beat sheet. And then that beat sheet, by the time I've done an outline and a treatment and then a beat sheet, I pretty much know how that script document is, is, is going to evolve. And I can go right into final draft and start basically just filling in the blanks. So that's kind of my process. And then, you know, you refine dialogue over a series of revisions. Okay. Nobody nails the dialogue in the first try guaranteed. Nobody, nobody nails the dialogue on the first try. So if you can have everything else in line and have everything else working, to where you're not trying to tweak story flow and dialogue at the same time, you're going to find an, e an easier time of writing your scripts. But if you're working on too many aspects of your story at the same time, uh, one of your prep documents uh, failed you in some, in some regard. Okay. I think that's my opinion. Okay. Because when I get to revising my, my initial draft, I'm purely working on dialogue. Uh, I might trade action here and there. Um, if I see something's not quite so, so there's a transition that's not working smoothly or whatever, I might trade some action here and there, but I'm mostly revising the dialogue to make it sound believable and realistic. And that takes, you know, listening and, and, and enunciating and, and, and hearing it play back 
uh, in real time to decide how, you know, if that dialogue rings true or not. Do I believe what this character is saying or not? Okay, and we'll talk about that more uh, in, a, in a week or so. Okay, um, blah, 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 blah. Here's the Blake Snyder one. Um, eh, you guys can watch this on your own, okay? It's only about, I think, six minutes, and it's embedded in web courses. Um, he kind of follows the no film school um, route. Uh, his beats, I think, have 15 beats. Uh, no film school had 16. Uh, I'm using a 12 beat structure, so it's a little bit different. Um, and he follows again, he's got his thing. It's called the uh, save the cat. You know, we talked about, um, uh, we talked about the writer in the beginning who talked about all writing, all the three act structure is, is creating a hero, uh, putting your hero in a tree, throwing rocks at your hero, and then getting your hero out of the tree. That's it. That's the process. Blake's basically got the same theory, except he says, you have a cat your cat is stuck in a tree and you get your cat out of the tree and that's three X structure. Right. So he's got, you know, save the cat is his branding, uh, but it's all basically the same concept. Okay. So he talks about his uh, beat sheet and how he breaks it down. You might find it interesting. You may find it helpful. You may not. Um, I have given you guys a downloadable PDF on web courses. You can pull it down if you want. I'm going to show it to you here. It is a beat sheet and a script from a couple of writers over at uh, Full Sail, a couple of their uh, MFA instructors. So I'm going to open that now and show you that business. Is it here? Or is it the other one? It's the other one. Okay. Ah, here we go. Oh, whoop, is that it? Oh, that's mine. Yeah, here we go. Samples. Okay, so here's a sample beat sheet uh, from the uh, professors over at uh, Full Sail. All right, so they've got uh, John King and Bethany Duvall are the writers. Their story is called, um, what is it called? An appropriate uh, something or other here. Let's see. It's called, oh, Funeral Homecoming. Sorry. All right. Act one, exterior funeral home day. There's only one beat. So this is, what do we call this? Slug line. Well, yeah, this is a slug line, exterior funeral home day. And then we have one beat. Alexander steps out of a taxi and walks towards the funeral home. Now we're into another slug line. So this is what, according to the no film school, beat sheet philosophy or theory, this is what? Should I go back to the graphic? Our first frame, right? It's our first frame. Okay, the first frame, it's the setup, it's doing what? Establishing the world showing us the world, right? And the world for the sake of this script and at least the first three scenes looks like it's interior funeral home. So the world is a funeral home and the action and interaction of two characters in the funeral home. Interior funeral home day, that's your next slug line. Okay, here's the, it's called intro. They've labeled it intro and then they've labeled an inciting incident. The intro is Claudia sits in a funeral parlor lobby swiping through coffin options on her cell phone. So we went from watching someone called Alexandra stepping out of a taxi and walking into the funeral home. When we go into the funeral home, the first thing we see is another individual, Claudia, sitting in the parlor, swiping through images on her cell phone. The inciting incident then is Alexandra shows up in time to help plan the funeral, surprising Claudia. The sisters argue over coffin styles. Claudia makes passive aggressive comments about their mother. So now we know it's the mother who died. We know that these two people are sisters and Claudia was already inside at the funeral parlor and Alexander came in secondly. So Claudia is 
maybe we're supposed to think that she's the more dependable one because she was there first and she might be the one who's who always handles the details first and then the maybe the younger sister presumably comes straggling in late uh and so we we kind of we've got some clues as to the dynamic of the relationship between the two sisters already just from the beat sheet right Alexandra refuses to escalate the situation. So Claudia makes the passive aggressive comments. Maybe she's bitter because she got here on time and her sister was late. So she starts snarking at her, right? But Alexandra doesn't take the bait, refuses to escalate. Claudia makes derogatory comments about Alexandra's work. Alexandra changes the subject. Turning point, Claudia asks Alexandra not to come to the planning session. So the inciting incident was Alexander shows up late, but she does want to help. The other sister is snarking at her, uh, feeling superior. I'm always the one that I'm the reliable one. You're the one who always has something better to do, this sort of thing. And the turning point is, you know what? Don't bother. Don't come to the planning session. I don't need your help. That's the turning point. Act two, interior funeral home day. Rising action. Okay. so. It's escalating. Alexandra claims she was always their father's favorite. Claudia accuses Alexandra of neglecting their father when she was sick. The two argue about long and recent past incidents related to their father in his church. Midpoint, Alexandra informs Claudia that their father had a mistress. Rising action again. Or we might call that a second inciting incident instead of a midpoint. Right. But at the midpoint, the midpoint is very specific. Blake uh, Snyder is going to talk about midpoint. The theory is if you could draw the story structure of this script on a bell curve, the, the midpoint would be at the top of an arc, right? The epitome of the building tension. And then everything on the back side of that slides towards resolution. All right. At the midpoint, your script is allegedly a mirror. The beginning to the midpoint and the midpoint to the end are about the same length, and they're going to have maybe similar, ultimately similar structure, right? Lahush Egri used to illustrate it in the form of an oval story structure, starting at the top, going down to a midpoint and rising to a resolution like that. Um, you know, some of these other folks are using, you know, the bell curve. Um, there's lots of different curve shapes in the story structure architect. If it's, you know, rising action, incident, 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 they gradually go up and up and up though, and then down the backside, whatever, whatever you're using, that's fine. But the midpoint is very specific. At the midpoint, it's usually the epitome of the conflict that has to be resolved is usually at the midpoint, right? We know exactly what the problem is. We have some sense of how we're going to resolve it. And all we have to do at this point is follow through with the plan and see how it pans out. The midpoint, right? If you've got too much script happening before the midpoint, and you can find the midpoint by just counting the pages of the script. So if you've got a 90 page script, where's the midpoint? Page 45. Bingo. So if you got, if you come to page 45 and you're still building towards your climax, something ain't right. Either your resolution's not long enough, not clear enough, not enough detail, or you wasted a lot of time getting to your midpoint and there's probably something you can trim out or a, or a more efficient way of getting to page 45. Does that make sense? Anyone? Yes or no to making sense? Good. Ah, thumbs up. Excellent. Okay. Okay. So the whole document, like I said, you can download and take a look more closely at it if you want to. But what I want to show you now is the actual script. So here is the funeral homecoming. All right. So here is our first shot. Taxi pulls up and Alexandra, 33, steps out of the car. She walks towards the funeral home door. Notice there's nothing else about Alexander there, just that she's 33. 
could put more in there. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe in the initial draft, you don't have it in there. Maybe in subsequent drafts, you start telling us, you know, what they look like, how they walk, how they talk, you know, something about them that sort of gives us a clue as to who this person is, personality type or projection type, persona type. Uh, in this case, the only person we can help at this point is the casting director. The casting director is looking for a woman in her early 30s. That's all we can do for them at this point. And maybe that's all we do in an initial draft. Alexandra pulls up in the car. She steps out and walks towards the funeral home. The interior, we see Claudia, 23. So Claudia is the younger sister. 23, slouches in the chair of the lobby, swiping through coffin options on her phone app. Slouching is new. We didn't have that in the beat sheet. Claudia slouches in a chair, swiping on her cell phone. Uh, she's looking at different options. Her facial expressions show a range of interest, disgust, and delight. On the wall hangs a big wooden cross. Okay, so she's in a sectarian funeral home. Uh, cross signifies Christianity. She's slouching in her chair, and she's going through a range of emotions looking for looking at coffin choices. So she's not really happy to be there, probably. She's the younger of the two sisters. We've learned at least that much about her. Claudia, nope, hmm, yet, absolutely not, maybe. This is talking to herself, clearly. Alexander enters the lobby quietly. Claudia does not notice her. Alexander stands behind Claudia, looking over her shoulder at the phone screen. Claudia swipes her phone screen and makes an expression of disgust at the image of an obnoxiously ornate coffin. Alexandra. That's hideous, don't you think? Claudia straightens in the chair, flips the phone over so the screen is down. Just because it's traditional doesn't make it ugly. Beat. Claudia goes back to her swiping while continuing to sit up straight. Alexandra sits down beside Claudia. Claudia does not look up. You got here sooner than I thought you would. I canceled some appointments. You mean dates? Okay. Claudia. Beat. Mom isn't coming. Do you think she would? Did you call her? It's on my way. To, it's on my to-do list. Between who and who? All right. So it's not mom who's dead. It's somebody else. Maybe dad. Don't know yet. Alexandra gestures at the phone. Interesting way to choose a coffin. What do you think dad would have liked? Okay, dad's dead. What have you chosen? I'm narrowing it down today. Pastor Jimmy and I will finalize all that this afternoon. So Claudia is making all the choices apparently about what kind of casket to put dear old dad in uh, for his funeral? Alexandra, great. What time? Claudia looks up from her phone to meet Alexandra's gaze. Claudia, do you really think it's appropriate for someone in your line of work to meet dad, to meet with dad's pastor? Alexandra uncrosses, then crosses her legs. Yes. Claudia stands and walks over to the large wooden cross on the wall. She turns around to face Alexandra. The cross looms behind her, aligned with her shoulders. Please don't come. Interesting interactions happening here. Just in the dialogue, we get a little bit of exposition. Do you think it's appropriate for you to meet with a pastor about the plans to bury dear old dad in your line of work? What could that possibly be? Must be something that conflicts with the dogmatic belief systems or norms of the Christian church. Let's see. Claudia, yes. Oh, to meet with the pastor? Yes, Alexander stands. Do you think it's appropriate to prevent a daughter from helping plan her father's funeral. This was his church. You don't want to embarrass him, do you? Just because you were dad's favorite when we were kids doesn't give you the right to stomp all over what mattered to him after you left. There's the definition of the relationship between the two sisters. You were dad's favorite. Dad liked you more, right? That's the nature of their relationship. Oh, I was still his favorite then why didn't you come back? I didn't want to let, I didn't want to upset dad. So when we talk about subtext, this is all going to make, you know, a lot of sense to you guys. By revealing their relationship in the dialogue, we're telling the audience something about these two women without coming right out and saying it, right? Because there's really nowhere to put stuff like that. You don't put it in the action lines. The only thing that goes in an action line by virtue of its label is action. So we're not supposed to tell you in an action line what a character's thinking. We're not supposed to tell you in an action line 
the relationship particulars between the two sisters. We're only supposed to tell you what those characters are doing before their mouths open and they say something. So there's really nowhere to put subtext except in the dialogue, how they talk to each other reveals their relationship. How convenient, and it didn't even interfere with your work schedule. You hate me so much. I didn't want him to have to deal with that. What on earth makes you think I'd bother with him or our presumably shit? Claudia turns away and looks at her phone. He told me how mad you were after I visited for Thanksgiving. That was a church potluck, and all you talked about were your so-called clients. You were still bitching about it by Easter. Dad was starting chemo, for God's sake. I called him every day. All right, so we learned that dad had a long and drawn out battle with cancer. Chemotherapy is a specific kind of uh, event uh, in a person's life. And so that tells us a lot about the father. He had some serious cancer enough to where he had to undergo chemotherapy uh, and he still died from his ailments. So the chemo was unsuccessful, but we can imagine if somebody goes through chemotherapy, and I don't know if any of you have this as a personal experience or not, but an individual who goes through chemotherapy and still dies had a really bad go of it. And usually that is not a pretty scene. So just by telling us that dad went through the chemo and yet he still died tells me a lot about what dad was going through, what dad had to go through. And if dad was going through a pretty bad time like that, it might be one possible reason why the sisters are, are at each other, or at least Claudia's uh, after Alexandra for a little bit of, uh, you know, guilt resolution, right? See, that's what I mean. You always think you're ganging, we're ganging up on you. He just needed someone to talk to. And of course he couldn't talk to the daughter who put her plans on hold for him. He had to go back to her, per, his perfect Alexandra. Never mind that you couldn't cancel your dates for even a weekend. He told me not to come. I don't believe you. He was really depressed and not just about cancer. All right, so this is gonna be a back and forth, back and forth between these two women, right? And in the beat sheet, pretty much that's what it is for you know two full slug lines, which is, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, into act three, they're still arguing. All right, and then interior mortuary. I don't really see, they're calling the midpoint early in act two, but man, they're still bickering after the midpoint. So I'm wondering if this midpoint is not correct or 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 if it uh, might be one of these later actions uh, it could be that the midpoint is actually when claudia tells alexander to stop interfering because that's when claudia draws a line in the sand right up until that point they're doing a lot of back and forth bickering dad liked you more no he liked me more you know it's all your fault Right. But when somebody finally draws a line in the sand, that's a point of delineation where usually the events are going to start to turn. You either cross that line and escalate the conflict and that leads to resolution because somebody throws the first punch and the other one finishes the fight. Or you back away from that, that line of delineation and you extend the conflict further into another act or that individual who backs away fails to rise to the occasion of conflict and is by default the loser. So I don't know, I'm thinking maybe this might be the turning point. What do you guys think? Anybody have any thoughts on that? Let me go to the gallery view here. Anybody have any thoughts on any of that? Somebody give me an indication. Everybody's mic is muted. Sounds about right with the, with that being the mid point, uh, the midpoint. I'm hoping for a little bit more engaging conversation here, folks. That's what a workshop is all about, okay? So try to be a little bit more involved in what's going on here, or maybe I'll just stop having these workshops. But uh, what I want is to tease out some compelling 
discourse here, some conversation that we might learn something from this process. Okay. Um, I don't know if there's much reason to go through the remaining script document. You guys can look at the whole document at your leisure. Um, I have, like I said, I have it embedded in uh, web courses and you can download it as a PDF. Um, what I'd like to hear at this point are any thoughts you might have on this process, on the beat sheet process. If you think that it works for you or if you think that you, you have a different sort of plan of attack, what that might be. Um, otherwise, uh, we can let this marinate and we can plan on uh, meeting again next uh, Tuesday. I mean, it seems pretty self-explanatory to me. It's kind of similar to what I usually do, so yeah. Are you, so you you flesh out your stories in, in a similar form using using worksheets like this or you just kind of follow up? Uh, I, um, I use, Blake Snyder, actually, for a lot of mine, I use the index card method, which the beat sheet is uh -huh. just the index card method on a paper instead of on index cards. So, yeah, uh, the writer that I'm bringing in for you guys next Thursday um, uses a similar process with post it notes on a dry erase board. So, it's basically the same thing. Um, as long as there's process there that's taking place that helps you organize events helps you organize characters and their and their dialogue or characters and their action uh if if you've got a system that's working for you uh that's terrific if you're in the beginning stages of your career i would encourage you to try some of these other methods um just so you can get a sense of you know the effectiveness of what you're doing now maybe there's a better way right um, and then the only uh, the only other thing I can say is, uh, you know, time and trial and error uh, sort of work this process out for you. Practice and writing, writing, writing is the only is the only other thing that we can uh, do to sort this process out and make it sort of second nature. Um, anybody have any thoughts or questions about uh, what have you got coming up? You've got character dossiers uh, coming up to submit, right? and some of you are still submitting treatments. Anybody in a bad place there or stuck or have any questions or thoughts on that? Uh, I had a question about the character dossiers. Uh, if I have more than one villain or, or antagonist, should I make an antagonist sheet for each of them? You could, I'm only asking you for one, you know. Okay. Um, but I mean, I mean, if, if this is part of a project that you're going to follow through on, you know, it's in your best interest to do a couple, but you only need to give me one antagonist and one protagonist for the assignment. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay. <laughs> uh, then in that case, uh, I, I suggest that we adjourn uh, so you folks can get back to your writing and, and, and schoolwork. And uh, if, you, if anything comes up or comes to mind, go ahead and shoot me an email and I'll address it for you there. Okay. Thank you, Professor Walsh. Thank you. Thanks for your attention and time. Have a good afternoon. Enjoy your weekend. I'll see you guys Tuesday. Oh, and by the way, um, maybe you might want to start thinking about if, you, if you're going to have any questions. The person I'm coming in is an experienced writer in Hollywood. She has sold scripts for television. Well, uh, she's been a teacher for the last... Um, I think 10 or 10 or 12 years, um, she did have what I consider to be uh, a fairly uh, good career in the heyday of television. So I'm talking about from late seventies to mid nineties. Okay. Um, so you might want to think about um, some questions you might have for somebody like that. I think it's kind of rare and unique access for you at this level. Um, and I hope that we can maximize our time with her. Okay. Her name is Betty Goldberg. You can look her up on IMDb. I'll, I'll mention it again on Tuesday. Uh, and we will have her on Thursday uh, for the duration if need be. Uh, I'm hoping that it will be a good conversation. She'll have some things to talk to you guys about and some, some stuff to show you. Okay. So that's all. Have a good afternoon. Thanks so much for your time. And I'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs>